At first, I would like to thank you for the invitation to take part in this very important 16 research institutes, and I'm head of the Institute for Biosafety in Plant Biotechnology. Uh, we all know uh, the challenges concerning agriculture, concerning uh, also social uh, economic issues. Uh, just to repeat a few of them which already have been raised this morning. Uh, the problem of uh, food security in face of population growth, we just learned uh, from the FAO talk um, that we have to provide much more biomass uh, on a very high quality uh, during the next uh, 20 or 30 years. Then the changing of the consumption patterns. We just learned from the Chinese talk that it is recommended to eat more meat. Yes. Um, in Europe, we are trying to reduce the consumption of meat. But, uh, of course, um, it is recommended at least uh, to provide a certain level of meat uh, for a balanced nutrition. Then we all know the problem of climate change and social and economic instability. Uh, we also discussed the problem uh, to uh, establish a sustainable balance of supply and demand. Uh, we also learned already uh, that we have to take care uh, that we are not losing biodiversity and that we have to reduce the footprint of agriculture on our earth. One of uh, the other main problems is that agricultural land is degraded by urbanization, uh, by growing activities, uh, by a lot of uh, other human activities. Uh, we also learned that we will have to produce 60% more over the next 40 years on the same land area or even on a reduced land area. And uh, we will face uh, with a problem competition between plate and tank, as we say. So competition uh, between food and feed production on one side and uh, production for bioeconomy, energy, uh, basic substances uh, for chemical industry, uh, then livestock feed and so on. So therefore, my clear message is that we need the crop genetic improvement technologies uh, to tackle uh, these problems. And uh, all of these technologies which have been developed during the last, let's say, 10,000 years, including our recent developments, are indispensable tools. So what are these uh, crop genetic improvement technologies? What is the breeding technologies uh, portfolio uh, of the plant breeder? Um, and um, I was very much impressed uh, about the development here in Brazil. And uh, I think uh, one of the key uh, measures is really uh, that the Bra Brazilian government uh, is really providing a strong commitment for plant research, for life sciences, um, also for developing, um, let's say, a science-based regulatory framework and uh, to try to combine all the different tools which are available. And I think this was uh, a key step forward uh, to reduce uh, all these negative effects we have learned uh, in the last talk in Brazil. So we need genetically altered crops with new traits like higher yield, pest resistance, drought tolerance, nutrient use efficiency, nutritional value. We also learned from the Chinese talk that uh, to produce plants uh, with a higher nutritional value uh, will be very important. And we have a very uh, interesting and nice and broad toolbox 
uh, to be used by plant breeders. Uh, the conventional breeding, which means random, undirected genome alterations through crossing or mutagenesis. Uh, the selection of uh, the new plants is mainly based on phenotype or biochemical markers. And a uh, characteristic for conventional breeding is that uh, it is not regulated and uh, there is no risk assessment. Then uh, about 20 years ago or even 30 years ago, uh, new tools have been developed like genetic engineering. Genetic engineering means specific but still undirected genome alterations by cisgenic or transgenic uh, DNA integration. Cisgenic means uh, that we are using the genes from the same gene pool, so from crossable plants. And uh, in the case of uh, transgenic uh, DNA integration, we uh, have access uh, to a much, much larger gene pool uh, just to take uh, genes from plants which you cannot cross with your crop plants or to take genes from bacteria or viruses or even from humans. Uh, the selection occurs mainly by molecular markers or uh, based on the phenotype and uh, genetic engineering is linked with a very high level of regulation and uh, a very comprehensive and uh, time and money consuming risk assessment. Uh, during the last, let's say about 10 years, uh, a lot of new plant breeding techniques have been developed. Uh, they are characterized by a specific and directed genome alteration with or without DNA integration or site-specific mutagenesis. Uh, so we can uh, integrate uh, point mutations, uh, for example, uh, which can be exactly compared with conventional breeding uh, tools, but we can predefine uh, with these technologies uh, at which part of the plant genome we are inducing uh, the mutations or the integrations or all these different modifications. So these techniques allow us to modify plant genomes in a very specific and directed way. Selection mainly occurs by molecular markers and uh, it is not clear worldwide, not in Europe, not in US, not worldwide, uh, whether and how these new technologies might be regulated or not. Uh, at least, uh, I think the scientific community uh, recommends a low level of regulation, but that might be decided case by case. Uh, so, which are these uh, tools in our toolbox? Uh, transgenesis, as I already, already said, cisgenesis. Intragenesis means uh, that part, parts of genes like promoters, terminators uh, can be used um, to be combined, uh, for example, with uh, plant genes. Um, then uh, I will then spend some uh, time uh, to discuss uh, the targeted mutagenesis by specific mutations produced by site-directed uh, nucleases. There are other technologies like uh, the introduction uh, of uh, oligonucleotides uh, or uh, to use uh, the so-called uh, transient uh, gene expression by infiltration techniques uh, where a gene is not permanently introduced into the plant genome but uh, the genetic information is only expressed transiently uh, during a specific uh, developmental uh, state uh, of uh, the breeding process. Then there are other techniques like uh, RNA-induced DNA methylation. Uh, during the last years, we learned a lot about uh, small RNAs, interfering RNAs, for example. Uh, it is um, a fantastic uh, development. Uh, and we learned a lot uh, how small RNAs are 
uh, very important uh, for regulating uh, plant uh, development and uh, the expression of plant genes and uh, all these processes. And uh, to use uh, these small RNAs, uh, you can, uh, for example, introduce uh, DNA methylation. So these uh, new plant breeding technologies have been nicely summarized by uh, the Joint Research uh, Center in Europe uh, in a nice report and also in nice publications. Um, I would focus the next 10 minutes uh, on the so-called gene targeting techniques, uh, which are, besides others, the oligo-directed mutagenesis, uh, synthetic genomics or synthetic biology, and the site-directed uh, nuclease techniques. Starting with uh, the oligo-directed mutagenesis, it is now possible also uh, in plant research uh, to use small oligonucleotides, uh, with, which are slightly different uh, from the original gene, so maybe only uh, modified in one nucleotide or in a few nucleotides. And um, then it is uh, possible that a stable mismatch between the DNA uh, in the plant genome and uh, such an oligonucleotide uh, occurs. And then by uh, mismatch repair, point mutations uh, can be induced. This method works like natural point mutation. Uh, it is used, for example, to create uh, herbicide resistance uh, now uh, in a quite uh, broad variety of uh, crops nowadays or just to modify catalytic centers uh, of uh, specific enzymes. Uh, with this methodology, only small alterations are possible, but interesting enough, uh, in the end product, you cannot decide and you cannot detect with any kind of technology. You are not able to say at the end whether this has been induced uh, by oligo-directed mutagenesis or just by classical conventional mutagenesis. So the question is, should we regulate it as GM technology or not? Um, synthetic uh, biology or synthetic uh, genomics um, has been mainly developed uh, in microbes. Uh, so complete new microbes have been generated. Uh, completely artificial. Uh, in uh, the plant kingdom, uh, we are just in the beginning. Uh, at least um, it was possible to, um, uh, to produce uh, uh, mini chromosomes or to modify uh, the chloroplasts of plants. As you might know, uh, the chloroplasts contain uh, their own genome. It's a rather small genome um, with a prokaryotic origin, and um, it seems that there is not a limit uh, to introduce genes into that genome. So not only one gene or two gene or ten genes might be uh, complete new synthetic pathways uh, might be uh, introduced uh, into chloroplast, for example. And uh, at least uh, a few examples uh, have been published uh, during the last years, how to use uh, this technology to modify plants. Um, a very interesting and uh, really fascinating approach um, is uh, the development of site-directed nucleases. Um, there are different types of site-directed uh, nucleases. I will uh, just discuss uh, the different types a little bit uh, later on. Uh, the principle of uh, the action of these site-directed nucleases is quite similar. Um, there is a DNA binding domain uh, which is uh, encoded uh, by, uh, for example, a meta, uh, meganuclease itself or which is uh, fused, uh, artificially fused uh, to a restriction domain. 
Um, then uh, these nucleases can be stably or transiently introduced and uh, expressed. Um, after the binding of a specific DNA sequence, uh, a double strand break is induced in the plant genome. Um, all we plants and humans, uh, animals, um, have uh, quite similar repair mechanisms uh, to repair such double strand breaks. And uh, during the repair process, uh, it might occur, in some cases with uh, quite a high probability, that uh, the DNA repair uh, induces mutations or deletions or insertions or a bit larger translocations. Uh, or uh, in some cases also a homologous recombination can occur. And uh, this uh, repair mechanism by homologous recombination can be used for efficient gene targeting. These are the four main mechanisms. Uh, the so-called meganucleases, uh, which are occurring naturally, um, already naturally. Uh, the binding domains are combined with the DNA cutting domains. Um, then, artificially, uh, the zinc finger nucleases, where uh, the DNA binding domain is uh, linked uh, with uh, the cutting, DNA cutting domain, and uh, you need uh, two complexes of these zinc finger nucleases uh, to cut at a specific site of the DNA. Uh, a more recent development, the so-called uh, talents, um, from the um, let's say, uh, detail uh, different uh, from the zinc finger nucleases, but uh, the same principle is used. And quite interesting, uh, a brand new development. Uh, in this case, in case of the so-called CRISPR-Cas technology, uh, a small RNA is used, a combination of a protein to cut the DNA, and uh, a small RNA uh, to detect sequence specific the region where the cut should occur. So to explain it a little bit uh, in that scheme, what I already said, a uh, combination uh, between uh, a binding domain or two binding domains and a domain which is able to cut the DNA to induce uh, a double strand break. Then by naturally occurring uh, mechanisms repair of the double strand break. Then in some cases, uh, in the induction of point mutations or deletions or insertions. In other cases, uh, even larger inversions might occur. Uh, in a quite rare uh, cases, uh, homologous recombination, but when you add uh, a specific uh, small DNA sequence which allows uh, a homologous recombination, then you can add complete genes in a very specific way uh, in a predetermined uh, site in the plant genome. So much preciser than uh, the good old uh, genetic uh, modification. Uh, with this, this technique you can highly, uh, in a highly uh, precise way, um, uh, introduce mutations or deletions, or you can even introduce new genes in a predetermined uh, sequence of the plant genome. Um, the European Plant Science Organization um, is uh, trying um, let's say, to strengthen the voice of uh, European scientists, especially uh, life scientists, plant scientists. And uh, from time to time, uh, it is uh, publishing some position papers, uh, a position paper which I have been drafting and which is just uh, discussed um, with uh, the uh, EPSO, uh, is uh, to ask the European Commission uh, to develop new regulations 
which are mainly based uh, on a report uh, of a working group which, had, which has been established by the European Commission some years ago. And the working group uh, published the report end of uh, 2012, uh, mainly to follow the, recommendation, the recommendations of this working group. Uh, and uh, since more and more breeding techniques will be developed, uh, we need um, a paradigm change in our regulation, uh, of course, step by step. Uh, the first steps might be uh, to try to define uh, the different uh, new breeding technologies, mainly on the basis uh, whether in the end product, in the final plant, um, transgenic recombinant uh, DNA sequences uh, can be detected or not. In that case, it might be uh, defined as a genetically modified organism. Um, but in most of the cases, uh, using these new breeding technologies, it should not be defined as a genetically modified organism and then exempted uh, for the strong risk assessment and strong regulation. Uh, but as I said, it should be done step by step and long term, uh, we need a complete paradigm change. Uh, I will explain uh, in the following, following minutes. Um, I have been asked uh, just recently um, by NEBC, that is the National Agricultural uh, Biotechnology Council of the USA, uh, to provide a talk about uh, EU perspectives on new plant breeding techniques in the frame of a very interesting uh, workshop on uh, new DNA editing approaches, methods, applications, and policy for agriculture. And I must say, um, it was not really easy uh, to uh, provide the European position because we do not have a position in Europe. So I was only able uh, to ask different questions. Does the European Union have a position on new plant breeding technologies? The answer is no. Does the European Commission have a position on new plant breeding technologies? No. When will the European Commission touch the hot potato? You might know that uh, we have a new European Commission just uh, starting uh, to work uh, beginning of November this year. And uh, I think for them it is uh, very difficult now uh, to define a posi position, especially under uh, a very hard pressure of uh, different NGOs. But the European scientific community has a clear position, and uh, this position has been published uh, in a lot of uh, reports, has been discussed uh, in a lot of workshops. Uh, so some of, here, uh, some of them are just listed here. But I will only focus uh, on the report of the European Academy's Science Advisory Council, which has been published in uh, 2013 and uh, I had the honor uh, to take part uh, in the drafting of that, I think, very important report. Um, so it's the uh, so-called ASAC report, uh, Planting the Future, Opportunities and Challenges for Using Crop Genetic Improvement Technologies for Sustainable Agriculture. And that report has been endorsed uh, by a lot of organizations, European organizations. Uh, I think uh, the most important voice uh, was the voice of uh, N. Glover. N. Glover, the chief scientific advisor to the president of the European Commission. Unfortunately, I have to say the former chief scientific advisor for the president of the European Commission. And uh, Anne uh, said that um, this report uh, is uh, very important. The conclusions are based uh, on uh, solid science. Then she also said that there's no evidence that GM technologies are any riskier than conventional breeding technologies. And this has been confirmed by thousands of research projects. And finally, we shouldn't forget 
that there are also other promising novel plant breeding technologies post-GM, and we shouldn't make the mistake of regulating them to death as we have done with GM technology. Um, the aims of uh, the report um, are, uh, amongst others, to explore the implications for EU policy making of alternative strategic choices in utilizing crop genetic improvement technologies for sustainable innovation of agriculture, to compare what is happening in other economies who have adopted GM crops more actively, to collaborate with African experts in agriculture biotechnology to evaluate how previous EU policy debates have affected African countries, and unfortunately, I have to say, quite negatively, to examine multiple EU issues for regulatory reform. Uh, the regulation should be science-based. Public engagement is very important. Issues of intellectual property have to be solved. New environmental uh, challenges have to be uh, tackled. And of course, uh, also a lot of new applications in bioeconomy. Um, we um, have been dealing with uh, case studies from comparator countries. Uh, for example, uh, special uh, issues have been uh, taken for different comparator countries concerning Brazil. Uh, we have been looking into trends in GM research in Brazil, and uh, it is really fascinating that uh, Brazil is developing a lot of uh, these technologies and uh, is also developing uh, a lot of uh, their own events, not depending on multinational, multinationals, but uh, really investing into research uh, and uh, are very productive concerning uh, research with uh, crop genetic improvement technologies. Then um, we made some uh, conclusions uh, concerning these uh, case studies. So you can read it uh, in the report. Uh, we also had uh, two workshops uh, together with the African uh, Academies of uh, Science. And uh, also these um, workshops were highly interesting to see that in several African countries, uh, for example in South Africa, where we just had our international symposium on GMO biosafety, uh, also their own tools are developed, uh, also own uh, events are developed, and um, there's also a high level of uh, capacity building now. Um, then uh, we try to define uh, some strategic priorities for the uh, European Union. Uh, of course, we have been focusing on Europe, but uh, most of these, um, I think, uh, strategic, stra strategic priorities might uh, also be important uh, for other parts uh, of uh, our world. Uh, priorities uh, concerning land use regulation, uh, promoting competition, then concerning the global context, public engagement, uh, achieving coherence in policy for agricultural innovations, uh, then recommendations concerning research and development, international partnerships. And in conclusion, um, I would like to say that the potential of crop genetic improvement technologies is very significant. It is urgent for the EU to capture these benefits, but also for other parts of the world. This requires better policy coherence to exploit the research and technologies that the EU was instrumental in generating. In common with other sectors, the aim should be to regulate the trade and or the product, but not the technology in agriculture. I think that will be a very important paradigm shift for the future. We have a collective responsibility to provide and utilize scientific solutions to improve agricultural productivity globally and reduce the adverse impact of agriculture on the environment and all available, available approaches, traditional and novel, must be deployed. Um, there are some comments, again, by Anne Glover, and this will be my previous last slide. Um, 
concerning um, the legislation uh, on uh, genetically modified organisms, and I think this also holds true for future uh, legislation uh, on new plant breeding technologies. Now, in 2013, with more research into GM technology than almost any other area of food research, there's no evidence to suggest that the GM technology per se poses any unique risk compared to any other plant breeding technology. I think it's very important uh, to say uh, that per se, uh, the GM technology is not uh, posing any other risks. Of course, it depends how the technology will be used. Of course, it depends whether the new plants are integrated into good agricultural practice, whether they are integrated uh, into a science-based uh, pest management, for example. Um, of course, maize after maize after maize with the same treats for 10 years uh, is not sustainable. So we uh, really have to integrate, we really have to develop and use uh, a good agricultural practice uh, to use these uh, new technologies in a sustainable way. To be provocative, can we meet the demand for food to feed 9 billion citizens by 2050 without using every tool in the toolbox? Is it ethical to reject technology without evidence? I think this is very clear that uh, the rejection would be without evidence but on grounds of preference when one billion global citizens every single day are starving. And our obligations as citizens is to look at the evidence presented and have the courage to reposition our views as that evidence accumulates. Very clear words by uh, Anne Glover. And uh, unfortunately, I had to say former uh, chief uh, scientific advisor to the president of the European Commission because uh, the new president, Jean-Claude Juncker, just uh, skipped the position under the pressure uh, of NGOs. And uh, this, unfortunately, provides a quite negative uh, picture uh, what has, let's say, a stronger weight uh, in the European political decision, the voice of science which has been articulated by all scientific academies in Europe, or the voice of NGOs. At least, uh, Isaac was quite active, and uh, Isaac has been protesting uh, against uh, this decision together with a lot of other science organizations in Europe. Um, so I want to thank you very much for your attention. And I'm always doing that uh, with a nice picture. My daughter uh, took, I think, 15 years ago or so uh, from the rem remainders of the Berlin Wall. Uh, you might know that just on uh, 9th November, we have been celebrated uh, the anniversary uh, of the destruction of the Berlin Wall. And uh, this is a sentence here uh, by Erich Fried unfortunately in German, but it might be translated uh, into those who want the world to continue as it is, do not want the world to continue. Thank you very much.